before I start and do anything else, can I just say what an honour it is for me to be your honorary president? And I think I should start with, the, in the great tradition of the American president, said, my fellow black countrymen, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to go on a tale tonight of why we are so internationally special. Why UNESCO gave us the accolade in 2020 as an, a UNESCO world-class large heritage site. So the way I'm going to do that is talk you through um, the types of UNESCO designations, because everybody only ever thinks of world heritage sites, but there's two others. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the global geopark, because this is truly uh, world, world-renowned heritage across the entire globe. I'm then going to do the dodgy thing of talking to a load of experts from the black country about some of the facts and figures that are relevant to the geopark, that maybe you do know, maybe you don't know, Maybe I've got wrong, and you'll tell me better. Um, and then I'll talk about what our, what our bid was, what we pitched, and then we became a UNESCO internationally famous site. Um, of course, I'm a geologist, so you've got to have the ancient history just as much as the recent history. So I'm going to talk about how geology made the black country. Um, I'm then going to look at just what we've got and how we tell that landscape story for the entire black country. And then I'm going to look at some recent projects, what we're up to now, now that we are officially a UNESCO World Class Heritage Area, the future. So kicking off, what are the UNESCO designations? So the one everybody's familiar with is World Heritage Sites. Now when you look at the list of them and why they created Geoparks. 97% of all of the World Heritage Sites in the world are very small sites and there's a lot of cultural bias. What I mean by that is there's, there's a lot of palaces, there's a lot of monuments. So UNESCO acknowledged that there was a bit of a, an imbalance here to all the kinds of heritage that there is in the world. So Biological heritage, the, the kind of stuff that gets in the press a lot now for the kind of um, environmental stuff, was not represented very well in World Heritage Sites. You could probably think of just two or three World Heritage Sites where the, the biology is a key. So they created another category called Man and the Biosphere Sites. Uh, and that one, again, carries that UNESCO kind of monument or museum kind of logo, but that's really about our relationship with the planet, how we affect biology and, uh, and habitats and species. Then they finally agreed to take on the Global Geoparks Programme, which is areas of exceptional landscapes and particularly those that tell the story of life. Because um, some of my mates ask me what's natural history, because they think it's just the green stuff. But it's, if it's the history of nature, natural history, then 99% of that's in the rocks. So 99% of natural history is geology. But they have no real good categories that were working for that. So they created these. And that's the symbol of the geoparks, the global geoparks. So you now know, I'll test you later, there's three types of UNESCO territories which celebrate world-class stuff. So, what is a global geopark? Well, it's an area that's got really exceptional rocks, minerals, fossils, geology. So, that, that's the key and the core to being designated as a, a UNESCO geopark. And so, I thought I'd show you a picture of the Dudley Bug, uh, because that is world class. That's, that's probably the most famous fossil in the world. It's in four times as many geology books as Tyrannosaurus rex. It's a fossil superstar and it comes from the black country. The other thing is it ain't all about the rocks. You heard Malcolm say it? It ain't. It's about what the rocks have done for a place and given its character. And we, we know a bit about that in this society. So it's about linking all these different types of sites. They call them geosites in the geopark to tell the whole story of how the landscape came to be, not just how it was built as a landscape, 
but what folks have done with it since and where it's going in the future. So this is as much about the cultural stuff as it is about the natural stuff. So there's a picture, I could test you on the pictures I showed, couldn't I? <laughs> These are all from the black country, so I could ask you what they are. But that's the pump house in Gorton Valley. And Gorton Valley is an enormous and fantastic site. Um, of course, in the case of all World Heritage Sites, what's the point of being designated World Class if you don't look after it? So you have to prove that you can look after the heritage you've got. So there's a big emphasis on protection. Then you have to show that you can use it, and use it and not damage it. So a gazillion people trampling all over, I don't know, Wren's Nest would be bad. So you have to manage it. And of course, what are you going to use it for? Well, if you've got special stuff, you want people to come and see it. You want the young ones to come and appreciate it, learn from it, schools to use it, colleges to use it. So we've got plans for linking all this stuff together in a big story. And it's global. So we can't just talk to ourselves or talk to them over the border in Birmingham. We, we, we've got to talk to the world. So we've got to share what we know and the good stuff we've got, what we've learned with everybody else. And you could argue that the Black Country has always made stuff and sent it around the world and they've always benefited from us. So this is just another example of that really. So that's what they are and that's what they're for. So where are they in the UK or Britain? So there's eight now. That's us right in the middle there, uh, the Black Country. But they go as far north as Shetland, which is very different to the Black Country, the Northwest Islands, down into Northern Ireland. Marble Arch has just renamed itself Quilker Mountain. That's on the Northern Ireland Republic border. The North Pennines, the, the big lead mining district up there. Then coming a bit further south, that one in the middle now in Northern Ireland is the MSG, or MGS. That's not the Midland Geotechnical Society for Steve who's over there. That is Morn Gullion Strangford. So it's, a, it's an area, again, on the border of Northern Ireland and the um, Republic. Then you've got East Mon, which is Anglesey. And coming a bit further south, Forest Valor is actually the Brecon Beacons. And then you've got the English Riviera, which is the Tor Bay area, Torquay, and, and the kind of Agatha, Agatha Christie stuff. So when you look at that list just for Britain, the Black Country stands out as being the really urban one, the gritty one, and the story is going to be very different from the, the nice remote areas like the west of Ireland or, or northern Scotland. When you widen that a bit and you look at all the, the geoparks that there are across Europe, then there's 92 of them in all these countries. And off to one on Sunday uh, to, to tell them about the black country, funny enough. Uh, I'm off to Romania, but a bit more about that later. When you widen that out again, to the entire world, then a couple of things start to appear. There's a big cluster in Europe, because that's where this movement started. There's a big cluster in China, um, very different origins to the cluster in China, and then the rest of the world has very little. Notably, if, if anybody says, where's a really great kind of landscape with some good geology, everybody says something like Yellowstone. But America are not signed up to the UNESCO treaty, so they can't have any UNESCO world-class sites. <laughs> so there will never be, until things change, any World Heritage world, by Man on the Biosphere or Geoparks in North America. There are none yet in Australia, and there's only two in Africa. That don't mean that Australia have got no culture. It don't mean that they've got any good rocks. <laughs> It simply means this is new. So we're in at the early stages of this new global heritage movement. And I'm very proud to be representing the team that got us recognised in that, on that international stage. So here's the bit where I'm going to uh, play with some stats about the black country for you. So in terms of our pitch to UNESCO, they wanted to know what our vital statistics are as the black country. Why we are good as part of the network of global sites. Well, this is, what we, this is a real summary of what we told them. 
But basically, we're, we're in the middle of England, exactly in the middle of it all, right at the heart of the country. We, we're relatively big, 365 square kilometres, or about 200 square miles in old money. Probably a real advantage to us is you can get here easily. So even if you flew into London, you can be in the black country in two, two hours by road or rail. Um, so we've got excellent connectivity. There's a lot of us here to appreciate what we've got. There's 1.2 million people in that 365 square kilometres. That's a lot of folks in a small area. And then you add in Birmingham, and you're, you're looking at nearly 3 million. So we've got a lot of people who can benefit from this stuff right on our doorstep. Of course we've got the exceptional geology, but we've got that unique cultural heritage in all, ain't we? So, <laughs> and, and they thought that was really interesting. <laughs> and and what's, what's really interesting, just emerged in the last few weeks, is that the natural England side of things looks at the Midlands and the Black Country because it's got all these nature reserves, as a really important place for monitoring future climate change. Now, I ain't saying they're blaming us for causing it in the first place, but of course the Industrial Revolution. They, they see that as the, as the place warms up, all these species are going to move north as it gets warmer in the north, and they're going to stage how they, how they kind of invade, looking for green spaces. So I'm working with uh, Natural England now to set up some species monitoring stations across the Black Country. So that could be a really interesting point going forward. So what's, so okay, so that's all geoparks and the, and the kind of rough stuff, and, and nobody criticised me for the vital statistics, so I'm going to take it. Um, could I have a proposer in a second for the vital statistics? <laughs> um, so, um, what are we? What's our really particular set of cool stuff, internationally important stuff that got us over the over that winning line to become a UNESCO sub area. Well, I'm going to bang on about the geology, but it ain't only me that's banging on about the geology. This fella here, Sir Roderick Murchison, very famous geologist, like the St. Davids and David, like David Attenborough of his day, said this in 1841 Nowhere in England are more geological features brought together in a small compass than in the environs of Dudley which is praising the natural wealth of the rocks below. But what he did, which was more unusual, was he then went on to praise the local black country folks. And he said, or in which their characters, characters of the rocks, have been more successfully developed by the labors of practical people. That's, in, in that time, that statement is quite a statement. So how, how varied and how, how kind of what's the variety of rocks in the black country? Well, if you paint different colours to different ages of rocks on a map of the black country, it looks like that. Now it's complicated because it is a lot of variety in a very small area. Probably the most important thing to say is that the purple and grey colours in there are the exposed coal field, where the coal field literally comes to the surface and all the mineral wealth is right under your turf, right there to get at and start creating money. The brown and yellow colours on either side are where the, the, the land subsided along great faults and there's more sandy red coloured rocks sitting on top of them and the good stuff's at depth. So that's all you need to know, but when you look at a column of all of the minerals that, that the black country miners were interested in, there's a hell of a lot in a very small depth. So you can't really say an average because it gets a bit deeper as you go north. But if you said there's 500 feet of strata representing the Black Country coal field, then you can reckon that about 30 to 40 percent of that was mined. So they took an hell of a lot out of the Black Country because it was one of the richest places on earth for, for these minerals. But those rocks underneath your feet do something else. So if I point across this bit, you can see there's some blue bits and there's a red blob. The blue bits are the limestones, the really tough limestones that they used to build Dudley Castle and Priory Ruins. The red blob is Rowley Rag, the big molten rock injection, igneous rock called Dolorite or 
red and red, <laughs> was thumped into the rocks at a, at a later stage, and that cooled to become really hard. So that's why they use it for curb stones and road stones. So you've got a, a swathe of really hard rocks running through there, and that's going to change your black country landscape. So if you if you look at what that does <coughs> to the height of the land, and on this version of the black country, the red colours are the highest points, and the greens and the bluey colours are the lowest points, you can see how those hard rocks in the middle produce a ridge, a really pronounced ridge, nearly a thousand feet at railway, down to just under 200 feet as the river Stour goes out past uh, Stour Ridge. So we've got 800 feet of up and down. And that literally changes everything. So if you then look at what that ridge and what that topography does to where it rains and how cold it gets, and I'm sorry if anybody lives in Sedgley, because you'll, you'll get the honour of being the dark blue here is the coldest places in winter, and the, and the dark blue here is the, is the wettest places. So you're the coldest and the wettest. But of course, that, the, 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 the way the landscape is shaped, changes the climate where you live. And that changes the soils. So if you're out on the edges where the brown and yellow colours on that map were, you've got kind of pebbly and sandy rocks. So your, your soils are going to be sandy. So if you're out Wolverhampton Way or Wombun or on the other side Great Bar or Top of the Warsaw, it's going to be sandy. That's going to control a few things because any rainwater is just going to soak away. If you're in the middle bit, in the coal fields, you, it, it's now a mess. Trust, trust me. Me and Steve know this very well, trying to investigate things and build things. It's all over the place. It's all been churned up by the miners. A lot of it is the muddy rocks from the coal seams. So you get clay soils. If you're on the Renner or the Sedgley or Castle Hill, it's limestones. So you end up with really alkaline, limey soils, like this. And if you're up on uh, Rowley or over in Wentzfield, you're getting <coughs> really rich mineral soils full of iron. So you've got all kinds of variety from the ground, all kinds of useful stuff in the rock layers that, you know, canny old black country folks dug up and did things with. But it ain't only the, the people, because it affects everything. It affects where all the different plants and animals like to be. So you can see from where you've got the clay, you're going to get the watery bits, and that's where the, the bogs and the, the, the pond life is going to be. You can see with the limestone ridges where the trees are going to grow, particularly ash trees, which is a, another story altogether. Um, and then all, all sorts of soils giving us all sorts of biological diversity. That's one of the reasons why they want to use the Black Country and the new, new UNESCO Global Geopark as one of these climate change monitoring stations because we've got all this variety that might be suited to all these species moving north. And that's all down to what's underneath. Um, of course, we, get in, we intervene with this as well. So when people play with the ground and then dump stuff or dig stuff up, we introduce all sorts of other variety. And Keith, I put this one in for you. So that there is the roundabout in Tipton. Oh yeah. That <laughs> the, a few of us were saying, oh, stop, it. stop mowing all the grass. You just, it just monoculture in the grass. Give it a few seeds and let it go, and you turn it into a wildflower meadow. Some of the tallest buildings have their own little climates, and they are really wonderful places for birds to nest. Where we dig up the ground and we expose the soil underneath, seeds which have been in there, which have never seen the light of day for 50 years, suddenly come to life, like the poppy fields we saw in Wolverhampton, Smesto Valley, not so long back. Where we chuck a load of furnished slag around, we get species that love the furnished slag. And then, of course, we stuck a hundred, more than 100 kilometres of canals threading through the entire landscape. And they are just migration corridors for all this wildlife. And then, of course, we've got our black country gardens. We like them, don't we? And yet, you, you heard Marlene talking about going to Ashford's and getting your plants. Well, when, you, when you bring them up, 
you attract new species. This is the hummingbird hawk moth in my back garden uh, on some of the plants that the wife put in. So that wasn't there before. So we're actually making it better, not worse, in the black country. Interesting, that is. Okay, so, well, how many sites have we got? If I, before I go on to showing you the stats, how many designated, import, notable sites have we got in the black country? For culture, for industrial archaeology, for geology, for, for wildlife, how many? I'll have a guess, I'll take any guesses. You could be wrong, because we don't know the full answer. 32. 32 sites in total across the black country. 120. 520. 500. 500. 500. <laughs> okay, shall we have a look? So we've got a range that goes down from 32 up to 500. Any other techers? 2,000. 2,000. Right, let's have a look. So these are just the wildlife sites for special species like orchids and newts and things like that, protected species. So we've got two SACs, that's Special Areas of Conservation Value, international designations, one of which is Fens Pools, so Penn's Net. The Snetters in here, you've got a, an internationally important wildlife site. Um, we've got two national nature reserves. So you've only got two national nature reserves, and I'm very proud to say both of them are geological. So Wren's Nest and Salt Wells. We've got 16 sites of special scientific interest, nationally important uh, nature sites. We've got 167 sites of importance for nature conservation, sinks as we call them in the planning system. So these are less than national, but equal to regionally important across the whole of the West Midlands. And then below that, we've got 471 sites of local importance to local authority level. So you're looking there at the best part of 700 sites. That's just for wildlife. Okay, there's all this stuff as well, remember, all these mines, all these coal seams. 11 coal seams on average, varies around a bit, including the thickest coal seam in the UK. The thick coal seam, the South Staffordshire thick seam, up to 12 metres, 36 foot thick over at Bilston. Uh, 11 iron stones, 14 fireplaces, 4 big limestones and the mining and, and disturbance of that's been going on since the Iron Age at least. We've got Roman ironstone mine, mine evidence down at Woodsitton and, and then we've got medieval underground mining from 1281 down in Alzheimer's. So that was pretty important and in terms of what people did with all that stuff, according to Doug Dugan in 1665 there were 10,000 ironworks in a radius of five miles from Dudley Castle even then. So that stuff's going to make a difference. So what about that? What about a geological site and stuff related to that? Well, would it surprise you to know the Black Country's got 26 scheduled ancient monuments? Things like the Galton Bridge, Bumbleholes, you know, um, the mine house there, Cobb's Mine House the limestone mine workings for the black country. We've got 300, more than 300 listed buildings that are protected under planning conditions, like Central Beacon. We've got lots of world firsts, and this is the one that I really like, because whoever I ask about world firsts, folks come up with one or two, but some of the ones that are important to me as a geologist, folks don't know about, so the world's we were the world's first large industrial area. Much, much bigger than anything else that had appeared before because of the richness of the minerals. We, because of that, we stuck in those canals and we had to put some of them in smarty tubes through the hills. And we've now got the world's oldest, still navigable, canal tunnel, Lord Ward's tunnel. I'm sure everybody here has been on the boat trip at the Black Country New well, at the Canal Trust, sorry. Um, the world's first pumping engine, the Newcomen engine, appeared either in Connie Green, in Tipton, t uh, it's called a uh, Sandwell area, or Wolverhampton, depending on who you believe. I'm a Dudley man myself, so I know what I think on that one. Um, but did you know that the world's first ever 
geological map was created at Castle Hill, 1665, 200 years before the British Geological Survey was even invented. Did Dud do it? Did Dud do it? No, good question. He think he did. He, he published it. Um, of course, the other thing, does anybody know what a seismograph is? It's how you monitor earthquakes. The first modern recording seismograph, which had the means to record an earth tremor over time, was invented in a basement by a local bloke who tinkered about this stuff in West Brom, he then moved to Gore and completed his work, and then he worked with a bloke in Sheffield University to actually create the world's first modern seismograph. So modern earthquake, modern earthquake monitoring was invented in the lab country. That has such important, important applications across the world to saving lives, protecting things, and designing other buildings and structures. It's the birthplace of Abraham Darwin. Abraham Darwin, great great grandson of Doug Dudley, a great great nephew of Doug Dudley, um, is also called the father of the Industrial Revolution. He was born on Wren's Nest. And then, of course, we've got world class glass industry. We could go on. So, um, all of these things happened here. The other thing we haven't mentioned at all is art. Because one thing us black country folks have always been good at is expressing ourselves one way or another. Um, and there are tons and tons of artwork that reflects what we're proud of out there. More than 500 of them. So, we've got more recently, the wood set in um, 1709 celebration of Abraham Dolby in the coping process. We've also got Jigger, the brown almost three story high silver miner it, it, standing in the roundabout, right in the centre of Brown Hills. That They are all tested testimony to the minerals and working with the minerals and the metal bashing and the, the things for which we are named as the black country. Another one which I think is brilliant. Which again, I don't know if you know about it or not, but um, the world's first high altitude balloon flight was done by a chap called James Glacier and his mate Forsyth. And they, they literally filled a, a giant balloon full of coal gas from the coping works over on Stafford Road in Wolverhampton and just floated off into the great <coughs> unknown, reached an altitude of 30,000 feet, basically passed out and got frostbite, <laughs> but discovered the jet stream. They, they took with them scientific instruments, some of which are still on display in Bartok House, uh, and basically created the modern science of meteorology. So when you're watching Shafali on the news or whatever, all of that prediction began with a flight from Stafford Road gas leaks. The, the balloon was called the Mammoth, that don't refer to the ice age in this, in this case. It was a huge balloon full of this gas, and Glacier Drive is on the science park there, honouring that discovery. But most folks don't hear about that one. It's just another example. And then in terms of the arts, well of course, you name it, it's there. Paintings and capturing the way it used to be. Edwin Brockton Bales is probably my favourite artist ever. Um, people were inspired by it for writing books. Dickens, Tolkien of course was inspired by the black country in a more negative way. Um, filmmaker James Whale is the famous one. And a lot of the stuff he came out with is kind of dark and uh, moody as well, like Frankenstein. Um, but then you've got your, your musicians and your poets. I'm sorry Emma's not here tonight. Um, or we could have had a poetry standoff, couldn't we, with, with Marlene at the back there, Emma. Um, so, um, but the rock music in particular is a genre that came about through all the, 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 the sounds of industry, the, the incessant roar and din of the furnaces and the, the metal pounding. So a lot of bands that uh, came out of that preferred the heavier metal side of things, and I must admit, kind of like that myself. Um, and then, of course, our local dialect, apparently. We speak proper British, because our language, the Black Country dialect, is supposed to be as close as you can get to Chaucer's language. So our dialect goes back hundreds of years. And of course, I really, really love the traditions of beer and curry. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much into that, and I celebrate wholeheartedly the people at the back there. Thanks for doing such a good job and keeping us going. 
in the aim. So there's all of that to celebrate. So that's what we've got to shape as a menu for the geopark. Collect all that together and you've got the story of the black country. But that's an awful lot of doing. All of this stuff, there's just some artworks in case you think I'm mad, say there's 500 of them out there. there there's just a few things and we could, if, if I was short of time, finish here and just play a guessing game for all of these. But you can see how it reflects all of that heritage. Um, so, what, what did we do? How did we do it and when did it happen? So, the roadmap that we, we went on to become a UNESCO territory began way back in about 2010 when the Black Country <coughs> Authorities and the Black Country Consortium started talking about what can we do with all this really cool special stuff that the rest of the world ignores. Nobody sees us because we're an urban area. And so we started exploring a thing called the Urban Park. So you may have heard of that. And that was the idea that there's a lot of green spaces in the black country, and they kind of connect, but they ain't connected, and people don't think of them that way, because we, we think of the bit right next to us on our patch. This society looks across the whole lot, which is why I'm so proud of it. We put an application in, in 2015, just at the point UNESCO took it over and changed the rules. Great. Um, and we had a visit from an international party in 2016 and a response saying, you, you're well on the way, here's a few things to finish off. So we put our final report into UNESCO in 2019 and it was due to have a decision on it in March 2020. <laughs> Us black country folks don't do anything the easy way, do we? So, well, obviously, that went out the window. They couldn't meet. So UNESCO held some emergency online meetings. And we finally got designated on the 10th of July, 2020. I was on the phone saying, can you make it the 14th of July? Because that's Black Country Day. But we missed it by four days. So we effectively became a UNESCO territory, the whole of the Black Country, for all of that cool stuff, on the 10th of July 2020. <laughs> then there's a four year rolling program when you get re, re investigated to see how you're getting on, what progress you're making. But because of Covid, they've brought it a year forward for us. <laughs> so, we could, so it's happening this year in June. So expect, all of you expect a call from me at some point. As a, we need a load of folks looking enthusiastic about the black country. The Chinese inspector's going to be tipped to. I want you to turn up and look enthusiastic and spade proper. <laughs> so, anyway, there's too much. There's nearly 2,000, so this lady here almost landed it on the name. There's almost 2,000 designated really cool features of the black country to try and include in that story. UNESCO were having none of that. So we want your internationally your best, your nationally your best, and you can have a few others. But you, you ain't having 2,000 sites. <laughs> uh, that would be 80 every square kilometre, more or less. So, believe it or not, there's stuff everywhere in the black country, but most of it is tucked away in the urban landscape. So, how do you choose? So, we went about shortlisting it. We thought, okay, what have we got? Well, we've got, obviously, a lot of stuff. Let's pick the top 50. Got that down to 45, which they accepted. Not just the special geology, you've got to prove it's there, so you've got to have them, but also some of the wildlife sites that are really, really important, nationally important, regionally important. Some of the cultural sites, the mine buildings, the living museum, the tunnels, that sort of stuff, Gorton Bridge. But most of them are a mixture of everything. So, a bit of everything. And so that's what we went for in the finish. Don't finish there. Two years ago, UNESCO brought this out. It's the United Nations things you've got to be aiming at for sustaining in sustaining your future. So these are sustainable development goals. And as you read across them, you'll see it's it's all the stuff that every decent person is trying for anyway. We don't want to see anybody in poverty. We don't want anybody to go hungry. We want to be sure that. Everybody's got a good quality of life, that there's good clean water, that there's a good environment, that we're doing our best for energy resources and to stop excessive waste. We're trying to provide jobs for everybody. So then the geopark's about 
really getting into the, the nitty gritty, using that heritage to do something better for this area, to raise it up, to give it that profile internationally, to get people coming and investing in this and to get their jobs in there for the young ones. Um, so we've got this continuous improvement mantra, UNESCO inspectors to make sure we're making progress, and we are going to do that. So we became a UNESCO global territory on the 10th of July. UNESCO gave us a few recommendations to strengthen us and to give us guidance as to what they think we could do going forward. They were, get more of the branding out there, let people know you UNESCO, this is big stuff. The area's never had this international recognition before. Strengthen the management, get more of the big heaters involved, do some capacity building, get more people doing stuff. Um, the sustainable development stuff you saw in that last slide, get more involved in that. Get the geopark being used as case studies for energy efficiency, for um, waste reduction, for community involvement in cleaning the place up. Uh, they'd like us to get more of the educational side of it. Um, I'm not going to do any critique of the UK's educational systems, but the international bodies just feel it's lacking a bit in commitment to the environmental stuff. Um, <clears throat> increase our networking with our foreign uh, counterparts all around the world. And now we're heading for that revalidation to show we've done that. So, let's, let's show you how, yeah, how difficult even putting that branding out has been. So, in 2020, when we became the UNESCO Global Geopark, this was the emblem they gave us. So, UNESCO on one side, the Black Country UNESCO Global Geopark on the other, with the symbol for the global network. <coughs> in 2021, they rebranded and told us we've got to change the brand. <laughs> so they came up with this instead. And then in 2022, they rebranded slightly differently again and told us to change it again. So this is what we are now. And trust me, I really wanted something more of a logo that had more of, well, the Black Country Society's kind of diversity of why the Black Country is so cool. But we couldn't get anybody to agree what was best. But that really tricky the people who do the branding. Um, so, we had to write some new brand guidelines so that anybody who wants to use the brand knows how they can use it, where they can use it, and why they can use it. Um, we then started reprinting everything. There, you've, we've talked about the cost of things today, that was a real pain. So we started to do new leaflets with the UNESCO branding on. Lots of these, using the black country flag colours. Black by day, red by night, so mainly black. Lots of red and the white in between. Exactly the black country flag colours. So you'll have, you've probably seen the, the new kind of visitor destination map for Dudley. We've done Saltwells and, and Wren's Nest and a few other sites. We just finished this one and launched it last year, which is the Rowley Hills. So Dave, if you're looking for walks, we do the Rowley Hills. We're doing one exactly the same as this this year for Bumble Hole and Warrensville Park. So again, building up that visibility as a united territory, as a big, really special heritage territory. Um, we've been telling the world, one of the things that we were told was you black country folks, you're far too humble. If, if you was Liverpoolians, you'd be ramming it down our throat. But because you're black country, you say, oh yeah, oh yeah, we've got some nice stuff here, but apologies for the mess. <laughs> too humble. So we started changing that. So. I showed, I just thought I'd show you a few of the magazines we put articles in while we were in lockdown. So believe it or not, there's an international newspaper called the Silurian Times. <laughs> now, that, ain't, that ain't a magazine about Doctor Who's nemesis, some monsters that they feature. It's actually the period of time the limestones are formed in, it's called the Silurian. And there's a bunch of international scientists who produce a newspaper and all the new stuff. So we were new stuff, so I got it in there. So the Black Country got mentioned all around the world in that one. The strangest one of all that I got involved in was this one on the right. Now I know you can't see it from the back, but this is an Iranian journal of geoconservation. <laughs> and it was a special edition about geoparks and how they look after their special heritage. So we did uh, 
an article and got that published in Iran. <laughs> so so um, we got Iran, Iran and, and Global with the Simon. We also got the BBC Wildlife magazine, that one there. And this is an international oil industry journal um, from a company called uh, Neftex, who wanted, they were looking for areas where they could teach their oil industry geologists. Again, I'm not going into the, <laughs> the ethics of that, but basically where there's good stratigraphy, good sedimentary sequences laid down in seas or rivers or deserts that they can use and model and teach their stratigraphers about how to find oil. So that was an American one. That's gone, that's gone to America. They can't become a geopark, so they're probably jealous when they use it. Um, and then the European Geoparks Network, we got a journal, uh, an article in there about the black country and about why we're special. That goes to uh, 177 geoparks in 47 countries. Um, and of course, those poor souls who, who found themselves struggling for things to read uh, during lockdown, I did 500 daily posts. Each one was an article about one of the special features. So I've still got 1,500 to go before we complete that. Uh, <laughs> but about all sorts of things. And that's online on Facebook. If you want to track back through it and you've got any interest in any of the geological, cultural or biological sites, there's somebody in there to please you. So you track back over that. We got on tally as well. So just before we became a deer park, we did Country File. Um, and that's Ellie, oh, that's me and Ellie chatting away in the singing cavern. Uh, that was an interesting experience. I've got to say, we with a load of uh, BBC crew and, and boats coming and going. We had to keep running into the side tour and hiding and then coming out again and carrying on. Uh, and this, is, this was more recent. This was um, in 2021, I think, when Mary Rose from Midlands today wanted to come up and talk about the geopark and about the Black Country Whites special. So we took her up the Rain's Nest and showed her a good time. Um, <laughs> of course, I've been, I've been all over the shop. So that was in Holland in 2021. Um, uh, on a Sunday, I'm flying out to Romania to talk to the, again, there's 250 geoparks gathering there, so I'm telling them about the Black Country. But we had some other international stuff, so there's a, there's a cross-channel um, geopark collaboration, and they're using us as an example of how to do how to become a geopark. Uh, geopark Amarique, which is Brittany, uh, we're doing translation for them and helping them to understand a few things about the geopark process and, and the geology of Cornwall, believe it or not. Um, and we've, we've done a number of these online global events, which are again really odd because you've got people in the southern hemisphere. You're, you're about to start your day at 9 o'clock, but it's 9 p.m. for them. So what time of the day do you start an international meeting with a 24-hour day mm -hmm. line change? So we've got people in, in Japan getting up at 1 a.m. to join us for a six-hour meeting. It's commitment, this thing, is I tell you. Um, so we rest assured the black country is on an international stage and we're banging the tail and showing why we deserve to be there and why they should be thankful we are. Um, of course, we've, we've tried to get some visibility out there for folks as well. And you'll see some of this as you drive around the black country. Some of it's fairly in your face, like the, the new wren's nest stuff, which also says, how much the Dudley bug? That was the pride showing through of the Wren's Nest Wardens. <laughs> so they put home with the Dudley board in front of the Black Country UNESCO Global Geopark. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, know, we know where the pride lies with the Black Country folks. Of course, even where we've got modern stuff going in like this, we've stuck, the, we've stuck the branding and the logo down here so that people feel just how important, how globally important this stuff is. You may or you may not have noticed if you were paying attention to the road, I'll forgive you for not noticing the road signs. But if you find yourself crashing into a tree because you're reading about the Black Country uh, Geopark, you can't serve us, all right? But there are 10 of these new road signs going up. So in, in the Dudley area, or coming and going from the Dudley Borough, you'll see signs that say, welcome to the town, and then black, you're part of the Black Country UNESCO World Geopark. Is this next bag? 10 of them are gone. Walsall are about to do another 10. 
And I think we've got some more going up as well in the early part of next year. So we're getting out there. We've been fiddling about with new technology. So new audiences, the kids like the, uh, the virtual reality stuff. So we've been dabbling with that as well. So we, if you go online to the Geopark website, you'll be presented with a three-dimensional walkthrough of the Dudley Museum on the top floor of the archives. So if you've never been in there and you've no intention to go in, you can at least visit virtually <laughs> and walk your way around. And there's even a bit of video of David Attenborough narrating it, showing on that. So if you don't know where the archives building is, it's this funny looking thing here, next to the entrance to the Black Country Museum, and we're on the second floor. So if you haven't been, come and visit us. Um, but we've also been doing some of these gaming things. Uh, so You're lapsed into American, you're on the first floor, aren't you? First floor. What did I say? Second. Second. Oh, sorry, first floor. Oh, well, <laughs> American. Well, I am the president. <laughs> uh, I could be excused that one, please. So, so we've been dabbling with virtual reality on some of these sites as well. So there's a there's a planet trail, a solar system trail, around Walsall Arboretum. So if you've got your phone and you're logging, you'll be walking around. You'll come to a feature like the glacial boulder next to Littleton Lake, and it'll go ping. Uh, and a picture of Saturn up here. And it's, it's basically to get the kids to, to learn the solar system. And they get points and they can compete with the schoolmates. We've also got a virtual reality tour of Red House Glasgow. So that's another one. If you've never done it, a new, a new series of red, white and black signs went in, telling the story of glass making on that site. And for every one, you showing your phone over that, and a video will come up, or some extra information will come up. So we, we try it. We try in these new gizmos. Um, I have no idea yet if they're going to be as positive, um, positive as we are. Right, I'm getting through some of the good stuff, but I'm getting you back to rocks now. So one of the things we have to do is manage our sites, maintain the sites, make sure they're, they're up there and in everybody's face so that folks can enjoy them and that people can study them and learn from them. So this is the kind of game, so I'm going to show you a few examples of a few of the sites in the geopark. So Stafford Road, where we talked about the gas balloon going on, has a little quarry round the corner called Gorsebrook Road Quarry. And it was landfilled and out of bounds. So you couldn't go in there, you couldn't see what Wolverhampton was built on. So we had a dialogue with the planning department they cleaned it up, and as part of that, the old rock faces that used to look like that, which you couldn't see a rock face, you wouldn't have known it was there, now look like this. And that's allowed me and some scientists to go in and have a really close look at them rocks and work out the history of ancient rivers that overlap to build up the plateau on which Wolverhampton stands. So a bit of science coming to that. But of course, we also need to explain it to everybody. And because it ain't all about geology, we've got a little bit about geology in the landscape, and then a big bit here about the manor house that used to stay there as well. So we're wrapping it together. No longer sticking ourselves in little pigeonholes. I, I'm a wildlife person, I'm an industrial archaeologist. This is about the landscape, it's about everything. Um, and so that's now on the fence there at Gorsebrook with a new fence and management regime in place for that one. Anybody familiar with Bumble Hole? Cobb's engine house and that lot. Well, if you, if, you were in, if you were doing your daily exercise during lockdown, you may have noticed that there's a whole suite of brand new paths gone in there. So that's really improved things. And on the back of that now, we're writing the new Bumble Hole trail. So that's another one for us. Uh, Walsall, there's a really interesting project we've been doing in Walsall called Purple Horizons. So it's all about creating some new heathland. Believe it or not, all them sandy rocks all around the edges of the coal field used to be covered in heath and linked up as one massive heathland area. Natural England have got ambitions to link it all back together again. As we developed the land and we built our towns, we chopped it all up, we carved it up, we broke all the kind of green connections. So there's a project kicking off now, it's a national project. We've called our bit of it 
focal horizons. And it's basically, we've got four years, we're going to be turning it back from wasteland to heathland. Uh, and it stretches all the way from Cannock Chase through Walsall and out to Sutton Park. We're going to try and do all sorts of stuff with education. We've made some films. There's going to be particular focus on bees and wasps, the pollinators. Because again, if you've seen any of the recent news, there's a real worry that we're using all these chemicals and killing all the, the bees and the wasps. And actually, that's a problem for the farmers whose crops are not being fertilised uh, and are uh, failing. So we, we've done some work, and I'll show you this in a bit more detail. So Bar Beacon, if any of you know that bit of Warsaw, has this big quarry called Pinfold Lane Quarry. And that provided a lot of the sand and gravel that built a lot of structures in Birmingham and part of the motorway and stuff like that. Well, back in 20, 20, 2009, when we started putting the bit together for the deer park, that quarry looked like that. In 2015, when we actually submitted the bit to become a deer park, that quarry looked like that. By the time the inspectors came, and a few years after, <laughs> the quarry looked like that. So nature, as a habit of being a friend and a problem, and now, with the Purple Horizons money, we've returned it back to its original heritage state. We can talk about the industries, we can talk about that connection to the landscape providing the homes and the businesses for people. The, the interpretation that's got up there is around this idea of the sands of time, those sandy rocks, and the fact that Sand's often referred to as running out, so we designed it around the old hourglass um, and placed it in positions where it really tells you what you're looking at. Because, I don't know about you lot, but when I was growing up, seeing a bunch of rocks in a rock face was not as easy to understand as seeing a factory. I understood the factory, didn't understand the rocks so well. But if you don't tell anybody or you provide the, the stuff there, nobody's going to understand the rocks. So. The last little bit then is about how are we going to make this bigger and more embedded and more black country. So I'm going to give you another example. Red House Glass Cone. Let's give you the my, I was main keeper of geology in 2020. So I'm going to give you 23 years of history of the Red House Cone there. So in 2020, that site, Stuart site, was derelict. I'm sure there are people here who remember it better than me. That's what it looked like. In 2020. In 2022, thanks to a European grant, we managed to get it reopened. Since then, we've started to hold events, we've done glass blowing, we've we now hold every two years the International Festival of Glass, gets us an audience, we've produced a walk along the Stourbridge Canal for the whole of the Crystal Mile, we've introduced this new interpretation, and we even lit up the cone in blue. Uh, when we were honouring the NHS for the work they did during the pandemic. We're now revising all the interpretation again with, G with the new GMR branding, and that is connecting a full story into a wider landscape, the glass quarter. We're doing similar things on Castle Hill. So, yes, there's us with our museum. The, the travel lodge that went up with ridiculous haste next to us has windows on the far side of it, covered in fossils and Murchison's quote. It's got, by the reception, inside, a kind of collage of what it is to be black country. We've got the Townscape Heritage Initiative doing stuff to promote the town centre. We've done this over the last 10 years. Um, sculptural floor in the, in the town centre. And, and within a year, we'll have the trams back. So things are beginning to link together nicely. One of the projects that links around the corner from that, of course, back of the Hippodrome, is the new development site for the Very Light Boat Rail Innovation Centre. When they cut into the side of the hill, they exposed a lot of interesting rocks. Graham here muscles his way onto site, says, I'm a horror geologist, I need to have a look at this. <laughs> the site staff got a bit panicky and said, uh, right, uh, the site foreman, you walk him around the site and make sure you don't cause any problems. Within <laughs> half an hour, I'd, I'd said to the blog, flipping it, this wasn't what we were expecting, I don't know if you know this, Steve, but that wall, that cutting there, showed us that 
it was all over the place. We expected Castle Hill to be a nice just up fold, a nice gentle up fold in the limestone layers. On the Black Country Museum side, the layers, some places are horizontal, some places they tilt to the south, towards Merriam, and at the north, they go north towards the Black Country Museum. It's been shattered, twisted and bent, and these white layers in it are volcanic ash layers, 10 of them. Never seen them before. So we did a bit of science on that. We also found a shed load more fossils. So the Dublin Museum collection expanded by almost a thousand specimens from that one site. Some of them, unlike anything we've seen before. It connects, of course, down all the way down Castle Hill through the Living Museum and on the back on the work they've done with the footpaths down to the Canal Trust. Canal Trust allowed us to host the UNESCO Global Geoparks 2022 meeting <coughs> there, showed us some of the new scanning they've done underground. The tunnels are now scanned to millimetre scale, so we've got a really interesting virtual model of the canal tunnels now. Um, <coughs> Forget that one, <laughs> Kevin Quarry. And salt bombs, the other national nature reserve. We've done a bit of work on footpaths and clearing stuff. Can I move trust to done some of that with us? It was only declared as a national treasure, a national nature reserve in 2021. So it, it's the newest <coughs> English national nature reserve. Wren's Nest yeah. is the oldest English national nature reserve for geology. So we've got the Alpha and the Omega of geological national treasures in the Black Country. Needless to say, we've celebrated that a bit. There's a, there's a new wardens base there with a teaching classroom. There's a new video being made around all these wonderful features on site. And we create some new interpretation. So there's all stuff to come. I'm showing you a glimpse of the future here. We've started to work with the Prince's Trust to transfer land management skills. Now the black country ain't the black country we grew up in, with the factories and the, the noise and the products going out. It's increasingly green, increasingly managed space. So we need people, young, younger generation, to know how to manage things sensitively. So we've started doing um, NVQ courses on land management. This, this was last year. With two cohorts of Prince's Trust people, four of whom have gone into this and got jobs here. We've also been doing stuff with the bits that were a bit despoiled. Now, you wouldn't have noticed this unless you were involved in the management. But this is the side of the Dublin Number Two Canal. And in one area where the tramway goes off down there, the old tramway, there was an area of dumping against this rock face. So earlier this year, we got in there and cleared it out. Only expecting to see the same kind of rocks that we'd seen there before. We were wrong. Because it turns out, where we shifted that pile of rock from there, there's an igneous intrusion, a bit of a rowdy rag squeezed into there. A new exposure of the rowdy rag and how it connected with and heated up the local rocks of Solomons. But what was even more interesting was bashing around a bit further along that cutting we started to find a new fossil horizon. So two absolutely unexpected new additions to our understanding of how things formed in the black country. So we're going to continue doing these international meetings, we're going to continue doing exhibitions. We did an exhibition in Paris outside the UNESCO headquarters last year. And the middle panel there, that one there, is a panel of our geopark. Telling, telling everybody in Paris, Paris is okay, you should see the black country coming to And we've held a few international meetings with international parties, and that's growing as an audience. Um, I think there's another thing that's coming in now that we're involved in, and was specifically written into the brief, which is the metro. The, there are 13 stations planned in the, the, the cross, cross country, cross city metro station. So as it goes, not the line that's in at the minute, but the one they're working on now, the cross city line. Uh, it's going to be 13 stations, and, and from the outset, the, the team behind it, the Midland Metro Alliance, wanted to do an arts project, so that on each of those stations, if you're standing there waiting for the tram, 
there's something telling you or reflecting what's really special about the place where you're standing. And they asked for the geopark to be a theme within the artworks that are produced. So there's a tender gone out called Art Track to a load of artists to come up with ideas and how to express the local heritage to that station where you might be standing. Waiting for a tram, thinking it's boring. What's this about? And suddenly you all look and like it. I never noticed that. So, so we've got an art track project um, coming up for that. We just started working with the National Trust and the Canal and Rivers Trust and a few others based around Whittick and Smesto Valley. Uh, Birmingham Black and Wildlife Trust are doing a lot of stuff there. And it's based around Glacier Bonders and the Ice Age Valley. Smesto Valley is a meltwater valley that was created when the last glacier melted 12,000 years ago. All that rushing water cut through the Tetmore Ridge and created a pathway for us to get a canal in, in the first instance, and to mirror that with a railway line, nice and easy, into uh, Wolverhampton. So without that geology, and without that process of the glacier melting, we wouldn't have had this, the technical gap and the ability to get the Smithstow Valley through the railways and the canals so easily into Wolverhampton. But what that glacier also did was it dropped dirty great blocks of rock from the Lake District, North Wales and, and Scotland on Wolverhampton. So we're now mapping those boulders and here's the ones in Wittick Manor. If you've ever wandered around Wittick Manor, the National Trust place, I've got a row in the back, there's the manor, of these boulders with an old set of signs saying 45,000 years ago, the previous ice stage, the ice was streaming down from North Wales and dropping these things on Wolverhampton. Uh, the sad thing about this is kids can pick up these signs, oh. run around and put them somewhere else. <laughs> So, so there's, there's about 12 boulders, and every time I go there, that ain't from the Lake District. <laughs> and it's because the kids have moved them around. So, so there's a project coming on on that. So we're going to write some new interpretation with the National Trust to explain the origins of the boulders. Um, almost finally, youth. The future of the Geoparks programme, the future of caring for heritage, making it accessible and making it mean something to education, it's young people. And in 2021, UNESCO asked for countries to provide a young person to be a youth representative for that country. There's eight geoparks in the UK competing for this. Young Emma from the Black Country Consortium put a name forward. We put a name forward to the UK committee recommended her and saying she's a really good candidate and she's now the UK's Youth Ambassador for UNESCO Global Geoparks from the Black Country. She has a job, she was appointed by the UK committee, she's got two years and in that two years she's got to find out what all the, all the youth think about geoparks and what to do in geoparks, get an act, a, a kind of profile of what they'd like to get up to Go report back to the Global Committee. And she went on her own to Indonesia to a meeting at the end of last year to do just that. So she, she's quite a, a goer, he's, he's a, a real go getter, he's a Emma. And um, she's in the process of establishing a, a UK youth network to make sure there's a future for the geoparks beyond us. Um, and she's, good. she's talking to everybody all around the world, getting the best practice for these things. So there's a real element there of continuity about things moving beyond a generation. And we're really proud it's the Black Country when uh, who's, who's representing the UK. We've also set up a Geopark Research Group. So um, this is really to start looking for what we don't know. So Malcolm's been invited to this, few others know about this. But basically, what don't we know about the black country? So what don't we know about the geology? So me and a few people are looking at that, and there's plenty of that we don't know. Um, industrial archaeology, archaeologists, plenty of that we don't know. Um, and there's quite a bit, as I say, that we don't know about the wildlife and the biology and how that's changing. So we've set up a research group. So we'd like to get more people involved in that. 
natural England will be involved, the universities obviously, local authority folks, various specialists, but also people who've just got good knowledge. So we just need to know what we don't know. There, there's one for you. If you remember nothing else from tonight, you say, our new president, he said, he's asked us to tell us what we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we, need, we just need to work better. Um, and so finally, what are we developing? Well, Cocoa Horizons, that idea of that ether, there's a big project, four years, there's stage two kicking off now. We've got Briley Hill Regeneration Zone, the, it's called the HAS, the Heritage Action Zone. So we're about to start looking at all sorts of interesting heritage links to try to lift the town of Briley Hill, to give the boost and the profile to Briley Hill. Um, Bubble Hole, as I've said, we're developing new walks, new ideas, the friends there are very active, we've got some good support there. Stel and, and Smesto Valleys, we're now looking not just the boulders, but now a whole kind of holistic heritage trail. Um, which it plays your boulders, obviously. Uh, one of the things that we're talking with the West Midlands Combined Authority about is a long distance footpath and cycling trail. So the mayor is very keen on this, and the street's very keen on this. There's a group within, and I had a meeting the other day, the Ramblers Association, Sustrans, um, all four of the seven metropolitan authorities that call the West Midlands County. And the idea, although there's no map yet, because that was what I was asking about, is to have a look that goes all the way around the edge of the seven boroughs, so from Coventry to Wolverhampton and Ross on the West, right around the outside. And what they wanted me there for is we are a UNESCO site, a territory, internationally famous now. And they want to bring little loops off that outside trail into the geopark. So in the, in the north, they'll have the kind of Heathland's Head and the Sandy stuff. On the west, they'll have the Glacier Boulders and the Wolverhampton heritage. As you come down south, you bring them into the cornfield and you bring them into the glass quarter. And as they go back around the west, they'll go out by chain making and iron making back over into Bull. So that could be really interesting. That's a long term project, it's a five year project. Um, we did a photograph competition last year, so you may have submitted some photos of your favourite favourite black country sites. We do it again, so that will be coming up in the summer. Um, we've got some research projects kicking off. I could talk all night about some of these. And we're talking about having a black country UNESCO Golden Year Park Festival. So maybe we can use the two ideas together to really boost the Black Country profile of the Black Country Festival. Um, and that, so that's where we're going. But what do we really want it to do? I'm going to finish on this one. Well, we really hope that we can raise that profile of the Black Country to where it is, where it deserves to be, but where in people's heads it isn't. So people still pass round the Black Country on the motorway network and don't get off to explore, don't, don't understand just how special and how important this place was to their quality of life wherever they live. We will champion this across the world. We're on that stage. Thanks to the Geopark, we're on international stage. We're going to shout it from the roof pop, rooftops, just like the, the Scousers do. Um, there's always been local pride and individual boundaries where people will do their stuff. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy here, thank you. I don't want to play in the black country. I'm happy being my little attraction, my little whatever. But we're breaking that down. We're all part of the black country. So we say, no, no, we ain't just this one. We're, we're part of this big story. We're stronger together. Imagine, imagine any attraction, any nature reserve is a, a, a string of cotton that you can snap just by tugging on it. You wrap 200 of them together, you've got a rope, and that could pull the ship. So if we just keep doing our own little thing in our own little corners, we ain't going to be a black country, we're going to be a load of broken threads. So we want to break down the barriers and bring us together in the geopark idea. Um, if we get more local folks and more younger local folks interested in the heritage, they'll care for it, and that won't half help us in managing it. Of course, the stronger the interest, the greater the protection. Um, the more groups we engage, the more different disciplines we work together on a project. That's Ely Meadows in Alzheimer. That's a, the largest glacial bowl I've ever seen. 
it is buried in a farmer's field off the, off the long distance footpath through the Ely Meadows. That's a mixed team of us, some geotechnical engineers who just turned up to do some digging, uh, Wildlife Trust, uh, Black Country Geological Society, and Local History Trust all got together to dig this boulder out of the ground. Then we realised it's going to be about I don't know, 12 feet across, 6 feet thick and weigh about 20 tonnes. So we ain't quite sure what we're going to do with it next, but uh, there you go. Now, the big game is probably going to be visitors. We've always been really proud. We like to tell our story to the world. They should have it, because their world depended on us. So when it comes to visitors, here's a few statistics for you. In 2014, we did a thing called the STEAM analysis of visitors to the black country. And believe it or not, the black country visitor economy, what we used to call tourism, back then, nearly 10 years ago, was worth four, uh, what is it, 893 million pounds. Second biggest area of our economy was tourism. We thought that had declined with the loss of all the two tourist information centres and people not knowing about us. But actually, we did the same analysis in 2017 and we got it to £944 million. Then the pandemic hit us and took our legs out. But now we're coming back and Christmas, every attraction you think of was sold out for the first time since the pandemic. So we're just undertaking the next steam analysis and I'll be very surprised if we don't break the £1 billion barrier. Now that, that's impressive numbers in terms of income to the rock country. But what's more impressive is that's two and a half thousand permanent jobs at every level from senior director to part-time cleaner, just on the basis of the heritage who all must lock in this room care so much about. It ain't just nice, it's people's livings. And if we can use the geopot to raise that one percent, that'll be ten million pounds a year. That's another two hundred and fifty jobs for the owners. So this isn't just nice, it's really important for our future. And the one thing that the heritage does if we do it well, that the minerals didn't do for us, it doesn't get mined out, the more you use it, it gets bigger. So the heritage scene is up to us to make it infinite and grow, and even more valuable. But it's all of it together. It's the wildlife, it's the cultural stuff, the industrial archaeology and the geology and the landscape together is a menu that nobody else on the planet has got. We have you in the black country. So with that we'll do more learning, we'll champion the green stuff. We'll all have more opportunities to do and see the things we like to do. That's where we go with the black country gene Thank you. Thank you.